stand and join as we sing about the God of wonders. Lord of all creation, on water, earth, and sky, the heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Wayne Young. Most of you know that. I tell you that, though, because our senior minister and I, Nick Skinner, have the same ensemble on this morning, being fashionable as we are, and I wouldn't want you to get us confused. Okay, yeah, he's taller than that. Yes, there's that. Is there more? <laughs> but we have the same shirt on, okay? <laughs> we are delighted that you have joined us for worship this morning. Is What a beautiful day that God has created for us to gather in his house and praise him. And we're so thankful that you've come to be with us or that you're joining us online. 
And uh, as most of you know, but maybe not all of you, we have a celebration picnic after the service, and certainly everyone is invited. Uh, that's catered, uh, and uh, we want you to be a part of that as we celebrate uh, the, the blessings that God has bestowed upon us during the time that we uh, built and moved into this facility. So uh, please be a part of that if you're here. Uh, we have these connect cards in the back. You can fill one out if you want to, if you like to do that, and just drop it in the uh, offering box. Or there's a QR code back there that you can scan with your phone and fill out the same information that's on the card. But if you want to share something with us on the card itself, you can do that. If you need to get in touch with us, it has our website on there, nschristianchurch.org. Or if you'd like to email the staff, you can email office at nschristianchurch.org. But once again, let me express uh, our pleasure in the fact that you've joined us for worship this morning, whether in person or online, and we just want it to be a glorious day as we praise the name of Jesus. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for laying out before us a purpose to carry out in the growth and increase of your kingdom on earth. We know that you want us here, that you have something for us to do, and as we gather, we just pray that we would open our hearts to your word, to your leadership to the Holy Spirit that would take us where we need to go as we serve you in this place. Thank you for this day. Thank you for reminding us of your sovereignty through the beauty and renewal of your creation. And we just pray that everything we do here is pleasing in your eyes and is only for the purpose of praising and lifting up the name of Jesus in this place. And we ask it in his name. Amen. You may be seated. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in one. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. praise we could ever bring, worthy of all regret we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name, Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust Would you please stand as our scripture is read today and then remain standing as we prepare our hearts for communion. A Psalm of David, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. He gives me everything I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me in the right paths for the honor of his name. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff are my comfort. You prepare a peat feast for me in front of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. I am sure that your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's sing about Jesus, our cornerstone. Spends on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ Weak, made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face. On his unchanging grace. In every hard and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ Oh, we 
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. You may be seated. Good morning. What a wonderful day to be here. We're going to celebrate uh, after church. We're going to go up on the grounds and have a catered dinner. And we're celebrating the fact that we're sitting in this building today. It's, uh, it's been a ride. I remember buying our property. I remember paying off our property. I remember pouring the foundation for the pavilion up on the hill. I remember building the pavilion. I remember a storm tearing down the building. <laughs> I remember rebuilding the building. <laughs> I remember the cool breezes as we worked up there, that always seemed to be on our property. And they still are. I remember our first capital campaign and our second campaign, which, by the way, is almost $100,000 more than our commitment. I remember the rocks being poured in the cornerstone of this building the rocks that we wrote scriptures on and they poured they put them in before the concrete was laid over i remember that i remember how god's hand was always on this journey and it always will be i remember a church being built during a pandemic i remember and no god was in total control of his church being built by the faith of our leaders and our congregation. Remember is mentioned 253 times in Scripture. 1 Corinthians says, 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 26, For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often. As often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He's asking us to remember. How do we remember him? We remember him by praising him. The last psalm in the book of Psalm is, is 150. And the psalmist must have known how to end it after all the psalms. Psalm 150 reads, Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I'll leave you with this today. After all the trials and the tribulations that the people of God will go through, the book of Revelation also ends on a rousing note of praise. Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. Revelation 19, 6 and 7. When we praise and remember God today, we not only recount all that he has done for us, but also look forward to his second coming when all things will be made new. The last two verses of Revelation reminds us, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's pray. Lord, we are truly blessed to be here today to celebrate our building and the, the fund that was raised to do it. But we all know it was in your hands. And we so thankful for each and everybody here that uh, worships with us and will worship in the future. I just thank you for the blessings, and I pray that we remember you in everything we do. As we take the cup and we take the bread, we do it to remember you. Amen.
Good morning. It's good to see everybody today. I want to welcome those of you who are here in person, those of you online as well. We're so glad to be able to share together in this time of worship as we do every week to gather around the table, remember Christ, and to be able to focus on the Word of God and, and be uplifted and encouraged by what God has to tell us. just want to add one thing. Uh, appreciate Wayne giving the introduction there today. On that Connect card that you saw there, particularly that digital Connect card, uh, last week we had the folks from Circles USA here are from Transform Scott County, and we're starting this initiative of Circles USA uh, to help uh, deal with those who are impoverished in our, in our, in our community, to help encourage them, uh, and to uh, help uh, come around them, to lift them out of poverty and, and help with that. If that's something that when you heard that last week, that kind of you know, pricked your heart, uh, you know, really uh, motivated you, convicted you, say, hey, I want to be a part of this. There's a spot for you on that digital connect card where you can click Circles USA as an ministry you'd be interested in knowing more about. Uh, and we can, if you'll click that there, we'd be glad to tell you more about that, connect with you. There's an orientation coming up uh, here on the 14th. We're uh, here at Northside for that. And so we'd really like you to consider uh, what uh, God may be leading you in as far as being a part of that ministry is something we're very, very much excited about. Uh, to be a part of here in our community. Let me ask you a question. Do you have an ulterior or an ultimate motive? Do you have an ulterior or an ultimate motive? For a lot of us, what motivates us in our relationships might very well come down to one of those two designations, an ultimate motive or an ulterior motive. An ulterior motive is something kept intentionally concealed. It's when we, we say one thing outwardly, but inwardly we mean another. When we maybe profess one thing to be our purpose, one thing to be our intent, but really there's another intent that's driving us. And an, ulter, an, an ulterior motivation is something like that that's manipulative. An ultimate motive, on the other hand, is something very different. An ultimate motive, you know, ultimate uh, really is a description of like the, the furthest most point in a journey. It's an anticipated destination. Uh, someone with an ultimate motive is someone like a college student. We know we've got kids now, just graduated high school this fall, they'll be headed off to college. And they're going to, to college with maybe this idea of, you know, I'm going to one day be a physician. Or I'm going to one day be an engineer or something like that. That's an ultimate goal. I'm going to start basketball. I'm going to play basketball, practice basketball, so, so that one day I can maybe be in the NBA. And that's my ultimate uh, motivation. There's a difference, a very important difference between these two. Uh, Jay Pathak and Dave Runyon in their book, The Art of Neighboring, uh, highlight this particularly when it comes to evangelism. They say our ulterior motive must never be sharing the gospel. That sharing the gospel must never be an ulterior motive. It can be an ultimate motive. It should be our ultimate motive, but it should never be an ulterior motive. And there's a big difference between the two. A lot of us, you know, sometimes we get involved in, in relationships with an agenda, right? Particularly as Christians, it can be very tempting because we know we want to share the gospel, but yet at the same time, we will enter into a relationship or are tempted to do so with an ulterior motive. And that is that we have this idea, sort of like a, a relationship with strings attached, that I'm your friend so long as you will accept Christ. But the moment you make it clear to me that you are not going to accept Christ, the friendship ends. And what we see there in that is there is an ulterior motive. We tend to have, and what that highlights really for us is this, and it's something that plagues all of us in our, in our culture. We tend to have a very transactional view of life. We have a very transactional view of relationships with other people. In other words, here's what we, here's what we do. So we're very tempted to come into a relationship with someone else and we say, I'll be your friend as long as you do X, Y, and Z. I'll care for you as long as you do X, Y, and Z. I'll be kind to you as long as you give affirmation back to me. I can be around you as long as your life stays put together, okay? As long as your life stays put together, I, I can be around you. We can have relationship. You can be my friend. As long as you don't add disruption to my life, we're cool. 
But if you do add disruption to my life, I'll do everything in my power at that moment to fix you because I need you to be fixed so that I can be at peace. It's a transactional relationship. And it's so, and we, and we make it so much about what we receive, my well-being. We make life this way, relationships. We'll make something even as good and as purposeful as evangelism about what's in it for us. Transactional attitudes in relationships reveal a consumer mentality. It's this idea, particularly in relationships, where we operate under this idea that you exist for my benefit. It's a transactional relationship. It's consumer mentality. And consumer mentality really pervades almost every aspect of our lives, doesn't it? I mean, it has so infiltrated our culture all around us. Uh, and it's so much so that it's very hard for us to distinguish it as an unhealthy behavior in certain contexts because it's just so much a part of the way we live. If we watch TV, practically every commercial we see on TV is about us. It makes us the center of our universe, the, the, the highest degree of anything needed or necessary or, or, or action to be taken is about me. It's about what I must purchase. It's about what I need for my life. It's about you know, my happiness. The end of all good things is the benefit I will receive. That's the message. Darren Key observes this. He says, you've seen the once famous actor telling you that you need to buy gold. And you've seen the endless parade of attractive people gesturing at that luxury car that will make you the envy of your friends. I mean, every one of us, you know, we watch that, those Lexus commercials as they pull up to the Frank Lloyd Wright house. And we're sitting there like, that is it. That is life. That is what I need, you know. Like, I've never seen that kind of house. I've never even been inside that kind of house except watching it on HGTV when the camera, you know, walks in the door. And he says this, he says, I know you've seen Flo and the gecko and the dude with the emu telling you what a brilliant person you would be if you let them ensure all of your possessions. And notice the word there, your possessions. The world drills it into us over again and over again and over again. It's our stuff, we own it, and the only good worth doing is something for my benefit. Now, we have a lot of kids, again, as I mentioned earlier, they're headed to college this fall. And that relationship between the college and the student is sort of an acceptable transactional relationship, right? A, a student, the, the college is sitting there saying, hey, we put ourselves out there. You know, we are selling this product. It is an edu education. And, and you get to have this with, your, with the college's name on it and take it however far it will take you. And the student doing their research says, you know what, yes, and, and I'm going to choose this college because I know if I get this degree and I get it with this college's name on it, that it has the potential to really take me very far and to provide for me, maybe even my family down the road, and, and be something that takes care of, of my needs. Well, and it's a transactional relationship that's very upfront. The school says, we will sell this education to you, and this is what you will receive. This is what you will get out of it. And so there's places in life where that transactional nature is something very valuable. But that transactional kind of relationship, that transactional mentality of what's in it for me has very limited value when it comes to our relationships. That's an area where it can't carry all the water, particularly in our relationship with God. Beatrice Rusu Shanrock, say that three times fast, Beatrice Rusu Shanrock. <laughs> highlights this difficulty in an article she wrote for Today's Christian Woman magazine. Here's what she said. It's a consumer culture which infiltrates our spiritual lives. What do I get by submitting to God? What's the upside of humbly obeying God's will? If I do something this hard, I'd, I'd better get something out of it. If I get some, give something that's fundamental to my joy and fulfillment, I sure hope I get something in return. And she says, we're all guilty of thinking this way. She says this, have you ever read Psalm 37, verse 4? Psalm 37, verse 4, and thought to myself, I'll delight myself in the Lord, and then I'll get the desires of my heart. No, we usually focus more on getting what we want than delighting ourselves in the Lord. I want you to turn with me this morning to that very passage she mentioned there, Psalm chapter 37. We're going to be in verse 3 to start out with here this morning. Psalm chapter 37, verse 3. And uh, this is another one of those Psalms of David. You see it in the superscript there to, the, to Psalm 37. It says, of David. So it's largely believed to be one of those written by King David. 
And in verse 3 is where we're going to start. And here's what he writes. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. That's where we're going to stop today. As I mentioned, this is a psalm written by David. And the overall message describes a very familiar tension that we all experience in life. How many times do we find ourselves in life in, in a moment where, we, you know, here we are, we're, we're following God, and, man, it's difficult. Life's a challenge, and it's throwing up roadblocks and challenges at every turn, and we're sitting here, and we're followers of God, and we're, and, and we're kind of frustrated by life. All the while, we see other people that we perceive to maybe be not really even caring about God, a people that we might perceive to be is, is not really even giving holiness, righteousness, any of these things, uh, uh, even, even a second thought. And they're just kind of living however they want to. And yet it seems that they're being blessed and these things are going so well for them. And even though really we know, truthfully, we know, Scripture tells me, you know, I need to be thinking about my righteousness more so than the righteousness of other people and, and walk in, in my walk with God. And, but sometimes the temptation is there, right? where we just get ta trapped in that temptation to be able to look at other people and say, man, God, where are you in my life? And, and the question really is, when we get back, we th we're thinking of this because we have this transactional tendency in our life, we have this tendency to ask this question, well, what good is following God doing me at the moment? And David's psalm here is a response to that notion, the response to that idea. The first thing David reminds us about here is about the foundation to our relationship with God. What is the, the foundation of the relationship that we have with God? In verse 6, he gives us this promise that, that God is going to bring forth our righteousness as the light and our justice as the noonday, and it sounds so pretty and poetic. What does it mean, and what hope does it have for me? What, is it, what, is it, what does it mean to me? Well, it's important for us to remember what our relationship with God is founded on. Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 through 20 reminds us of this, and, it's, and, and goes even further than David does in this moment. In Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, God is talking about establishing or really reestablishing a relationship with, with his people. Uh, really, in the end, it applies to us, his church, and, and establishing a relationship with us. And notice how he, well, you notice the terms he uses in this passage to describe how he's going to establish this relationship. Here's what he says, Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Notice the things we just talked about in the other verse, in the other passage here, and, and some others as well. Here's what God says, And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Now, the language here is marriage language, right? This idea of betrothal, ancient marriage language, a lot of us would think uh, to that. It's marriage language, and, and marriage language is the type of language God often uses in Scripture to talk about the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church. In the Old Testament, New Testament, he's using this marriage language. And, and so Christ always represents the groom. The church always represents the bride. In the ancient world of the Bible, and even in some corners of the world still today, a bridal price or a dowry would have been expected from the groom to the family of the bride in order to solidify this agreement for the two to marry. That would have been the expected, uh, you know, the, the groom would offer the bridal price in order to make this a guarantee, to make it, you know, this lock solid, this is going to happen. In Hosea, what we see, though, is that rather than money, the dowry for the relationship with God, our relationship with God, is paid for by God with five character traits that he lists out there. Okay, The dowry is these five character traits, righteousness, justice, love, compassion, and faithfulness. Those are the five traits that are the dowry that God pays for us and, and puts down so that solidify this relationship between us. Those five traits go by another name, Jesus. 
When we search for righteousness, what does God do? He shows us a cross. When we search for justice, God shows us a cross. When we search for love and compassion, God shows us a cross. And when we search for faithfulness in this world, desperate for faithfulness, what is a sign of faithfulness for us? God points us to the cross. The blood-stained cross and the empty grave are reminders to believers that our God has not forgotten about righteousness and justice. And as a matter of fact, not only has he not forgotten about righteousness and justice, he has also forgiven our unrighteousness and our injustice. So our righteousness and our justice are Jesus. And when he returns, he will be brighter than the noonday sun. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we were reminded of the foundation of our relationship with God today. And also keep note of that last phrase at the end of the Hosea passage. It says, and you shall know the Lord. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But the second thing I want to talk about here from this psalm passage is that David also reminds us to approach God in pliability. To approach God in pliability. Here's what often happens when we read Psalm 37, verse 4. Here's a, it's just a reminder. Here's what Psalm 37, verse 4 says. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Here's what often happens when we read this passage. We read it and we say to ourselves, okay, as long as I do what I'm supposed to do, as long as I live what I to believe to be the way a Christian is supposed to live, as long as I do that, God will give me my desires. He'll give me what I want. And so here's what we do. We read that passage and we go off and we make a long list of things we're going to promise to God we're going to do, okay? We say, God, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray once or twice a day. I'm going to go to church on Sunday. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to attend Bible study. I'm going to serve at the local food bank. And, and we're going like, to make this long list. Here's the things I'm going to do, God. And the reason we do that, we reason by the, doing all of these things, then God will give me the life I want. And what we do, what have we done there? We've, we've made it a transaction. We've made this relationship a transaction. I do what God expects of me so that God gives me what I want or expect in my own life. Never mind the fact. We forget so often these things that, you know, when it came to doing the will of God for a guy like Noah, when it came to going and living obediently for God like Noah did, it ended up with him being on a boat for 378 days with his family and just and all the animals of the world. <laughs> you know, you think about our quarantine. We think about what our life was like, you know, maybe a year or two ago. 378 days on a boat <laughs> was Noah's obedience and his living out God's, God's will for his life. Being obedient to the will of God is what led Jesus to a cross. And so we forget those things. You know, we forget those things when we think about the life God wants for us. And we think, well, the life that I want, you know, it's really about the life we want, that we want it danger-free, risk-free. God, take care of all that for me. And that's not really what the path is that he set before us. I want you to notice something critical in our psalm today. It's this word for delight. The word for delight in the passage here today comes from the Hebrew word anag. anag. And anag means to be soft or pliable. That's the meaning of that word. So what it, this is, this is not a transaction. When we read this passage, it's not a transaction. It's not about being with God and as a result of that getting what I want. What the passage is saying is something very different. It's saying this, that God changes me and my desires as I spend time with him. With a, with a heart willing to be shaped and molded. Because I am flexible, because I am pliable, and I approach him with that pliability, then he can mold my heart to his will. And once I've learned to be pliable and moldable and teachable in the hands of God, then he'll give me the desires of my heart because the desires of my heart are his desires as well. They'll finally be his and we will be in alignment. It's about humility and, and a moldableness that submits to the will of God for our lives. Lastly here, David reminds us to graze on God. And with the end result being to know him, that we would know God. He reminds us to graze on God. In verse 3, there's this phrase used there where, he, where David commends us to 
befriend faithfulness, befriend faithfulness. And again, here, the English wording kind of misses so much of what David's trying to communicate. He's a shepherd. He's trying to create or communicate with the language of, of the shepherd and, and the pasture. And so the Hebrew word used here for befriend is the word ra'eh, which also which can mean feed or to graze, to drive out, to pasture, to shepherd, protect, or nourish. He's saying essentially here, here's a, here's a godliness characteristic. This is a characteristic of God. Faithfulness is a characteristic of God. And he's saying, I want you to graze on this, to graze on faithfulness. And that means grazing on it as is exampled by God. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 15, verse 5. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. As we abide with God in life, walking through life's experiences, what we do is we experience God and we learn who he is. That's the ultimate end of all of this is that we we know God. That has to be the end of all these things, that we want to know God. We want to understand God. We want to experience God in our life. Henry Blackaby says this. He says, in the Bible, God took the initiative to reveal himself to people by experience. Frequently, when God revealed himself to individuals, he disclosed a new name to them or described himself in a new way. To the Hebrew, a person's name represented his character and described his nature. And that's why in the Bible, we frequently see new names or titles for God following an event in which somebody experienced God. To know God by name required a personal experience of his presence. And he gives an example. He gives an example. You might remember the story from the Old Testament. Joshua and the Israelites are fighting the Amalekites. And Moses is overseeing the battle from a nearby mountain where he can kind of see what's going on. And as long as Moses has his hands up in the air, with God, uh, head held up to God, the Israelites are victorious. But whenever his arms begin to tire, because it's hard to leave your hands in the air for that long. <laughs> whenever his arms begin to tire and he begins to bring them to his side... The Israelites begin to lose, and thankfully, with the help of associates Aaron and Hur, they're able to keep his hands up, and God eventually defeats the Amalekites through Israel that day. And afterward, Moses builds an altar to God, and he gives it a name. The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. A banner, in army sense, is a standard that goes out, sort of like what we would, we would carry the American flag, perhaps, if we were involved in the old style of combat that was usual in the Civil War days. Someone would carry the American flag as the banner that signified this is the flag of the Union or something like that. And, and, and the banner is something that goes, the standard goes in front of an army to declare whom it represents. You see, in this moment, in that action, in that, in that, that period of that war, Israel knew God in a new way, and therefore it was given, they gave this name to the Lord. The Lord is my banner. So we walk through life's experiences with God, the end of all things, the best of all things, is that we would find in those circumstances to know God in a new way. And so here's the challenge today. Seek God for the purpose of knowing him rather than using him. Seek God for the purpose of knowing him rather than using him. Part of the doing that is simply for number one, enjoying getting to know God for who he really is. Enjoy getting to know God, to know God, who God really is. And we find the greatest freedom in our relationships when we finally let go of all of the preconceived ideas about what we think the other person should be and we simply say, you know what, I just want to know who you are. All of you, just your highs, your lows, the, 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 the hard parts, the, the, the maybe the more accepting and, and easier to know and get along with. I want, to, I want to just know who you are. And when we finally just get to that place, there's such freedom in our relationships. Our greatest disappointments about God are often the result of having flawed expectations about God to begin with. And the best way to learn who God really is is by watching Jesus. That was the purpose of Jesus. One of the big purposes of Jesus coming to this earth was that in flesh and blood, we would see an example of the heart of God at work, who God is. Henry Blackaby, who I just mentioned a minute ago, he pastored a church for 12 years in a city that was surrounded by a farming community. 
And he says, one day a farmer invited him over to visit him at his farm. And the directions the man gave him went something like this. Go a quarter of a mile past the edge of the city and you're going to see a big red barn on your left. Go to the next road and, turn, and take a left. And then you'll take that road for three quarters of a mile and you'll see a large poplar tree. Go right about four miles and then you'll see a big rock. And Blackaby says... I wrote all this down, and he said, only by God's grace did I ever actually manage to find the farm. (laughs) But he says, the next time I went to the man's house, he was with me in the car. And because there was more than one way to get to this guy's house, he could have taken me any way he wanted to. You see, he in that moment was my map. What did I have to do? I simply had to listen to him and do what he said. Every time he said to turn, I did what he said. He took me away I had never been and could have never discovered on my own. I could never even retrace the route myself. The farmer was my map because he knew the way. And that illustration adds depth of meaning to Jesus' words in so many ways. In John's, John 14, 6, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the only way to the Father. And, and even as Christians... And no one, when it comes, we understand that in a salvation sense, but have we ever understood that in a sense of just getting to know who God is? He is the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way we get to know who God is. And so if you're really wanting to get to know God today, you're convicted by this, you're like, you know what? I really haven't been pursuing, pursuing all of these things, prayer and worship and things. I haven't been pursuing these with the goal of actually getting to know God. Now's a great time to start reading the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are the story of Jesus' life on this earth. The reason Jesus was sent here to be God with flesh on, that we would learn and follow from his example and discover who God really is. And so that's where it begins, is just learning who Jesus was. Secondly today, accept that the fullest experience of the faith comes only when God is our fullest experience of the faith. If we seek to find the fullest experience of the Christian faith, that only begins when we understand that God, knowing God, experiencing God, living with God is the fullest experience of the faith. Well, that is the end result. Scripture highlights many promises for the believer in Christ. And when those promises become the object and the purpose of our faith, as opposed to to just God being the object and the purpose of our faith, Those promises lose all their power and they lose their compelling nature. They become a performance that we put on and not a reality that we simply enjoy and receive. Thirdly, be honest with yourself about what you truly think about God. Be honest with yourself about what you truly think about God. Blackaby shares this. He says, one of our church members was always having difficulty in his personal life with his family, his work, and in the church. And in a church meeting one time, he became very angry and he stormed out of the room. And he says, it was obvious that his life was filled with anger. He says, soon after I met with him and I asked him, I said, can you describe your relationship with God by sincerely saying this? And I hope we'll consider this question for ourselves today. Considering our relationship with God. Can can you describe your relationship with God in this way? Saying, I love you with all my heart. He says, the strangest look came over the man's face. He said, no one has ever asked me that. I could not describe my relationship with God in that way. I I could say, I obey him, I serve him, I worship him, I fear him. But I cannot say I love him. See, this man had a father who never told him that he loved him. The son feared the father, but he didn't love him. And the man had wrongly assumed that God was the same kind of father. I had a similar experience during the pandemic. A brother in Christ that I had been walking with through a significant portion of that time made an observation to me as he was kind of witnessing some of our conversations together. And he essentially said this. He said, when you talk about God, I can hear a whole lot of obligation in your voice. But he said, I don't think you really like him right now. And as hard as it was for him to hear, to hear him say that to me, it was hard because kind of part of my soul knew it was true. He was right. He was right. In truth, at that moment, through a bulk of that time, God was a judgmental taskmaster in that moment of my life. And what's really ironic was that the moment I began to finally just be honest with myself about that and acknowledge that, 
it opened up whole new avenues of growing in my relationship with God because in my heart, I really did ultimately want to like him. But I couldn't really get any further until I could acknowledge that at the moment, I didn't. And I needed to grow and I needed to explore why that was, what kind of things were operating in my mind at the time that made it the relationship that it was. Lastly today, walk to know God. Walk to know God. One of the most common metaphors used throughout Scripture to describe the the Christian faith is describing it as a walk. And along that walk, there are Christian things we were called to do, right? We hear about these things. There are things we do. We do prayer, Bible study, worship. We we, we give. We practice tithing. We serve other people. We fast. we, We witness to others. And in the end, the sole purpose of these things we do must be knowing God and experiencing God for ourselves in order that he might be glorified in our own hearts. Is God glorified in our heart right now? Is that what we approach worship with in Bible study and giving all these things? It is amazing to see how something that the world might say, you know, the world might look in at a worship service, it might look in at a Bible study, a prayer life and things. We might even look at it this way. And we look at it and say, man, that's mediocre. And we look at our own prayer life and, man, it's mediocre. And it's amazing how God will take these things that perceive outwardly are mediocre. But, man, when they have are infused with the right purpose, with the right mission, when they're infused with the right motivation, it's amazing what God can do through with these things that are perceived to be mediocre. When people are motivated in the right way to see God glorified in their hearts, to know him and experience him in a greater way. Today, we celebrate the end of our three-year capital campaign. And as we do, folks, we move forward with something greater and more valuable than a sizable amount of money or whatever amount of money for funding the building, our relocation, the ministry here. We... We, we come away from this with something far greater, and I hope we appreciate this. I, I, I'm trying to. We walk away having had an experience with God over the last three years. Seeing his provision, not just for our congregation, but for our families and other people during a pandemic. We in this campaign, with a story, with a testimony about the God we serve, about his love and his faithfulness to provide. And if we will, as Jordan was encouraging us to do earlier, if we will take the time today to remember all about God, not just that, but all the many ways in which God interacts in our lives and is provided for in our lives, these are the things that will carry us through the next challenges, that will carry us forward into the future, remembering the faithfulness of our God. These are treasures that we have been given in being able to experience God over these past three years and a lifetime even of service. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the testimony that you leave with us. Most importantly, Lord, the testimony of your love, your compassion, your faithfulness, your righteousness, and your justice in the form of Jesus Christ. Father, sometimes we're all guilty of entering in. I think we're all guilty of of, of following that temptation at moments, to see it as a transactional relationship. Lord, to see that, you know, I'm doing this so that I could get something out of it, so that I, I can get what I want out of it, Lord. And sometimes, Father, we fail to see that the, the best thing we can get in our relationship with you is the relationship with you. To simply know you, to experience you as we walk through life together. And Father, today, if there's someone here who does not have that relationship with you, The first step, Lord, is is to change that and to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, uh, that they can begin that journey, Father. And uh, we pray that today, if someone has not made that decision, that you would lay it upon their heart and give them the faith to follow, the courage to follow and begin the journey with you, that they may know the God who lovingly created them, who compassionately sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for their sins to satisfy righteousness and justice, so that then the door would be open for eternity. Lord, that we can be restored to you, not only at this moment, but Lord, for all eternity to come. We love you, Father, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.
sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me, now save am I. Oh, and love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me, oh, and love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. to him I'll cling, in his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, there is my soul's best song, oh faithful loving service to, to him. completely saves he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves he's the master of the sea billows his will obey oh and he your savior wants to be the same sin was too much when I say I'm not good enough when I think I won't be restored Jesus will lift me Whoa. when nothing else could help song love that song the old way the new way it's all good <laughs> it's all good the message never changes and the message can always be celebrated I want to encourage you today with just a few announcements here first of all just as a reminder one of the great opportunities we have a great way we get to know as we've experienced over the last three years 
a great way to get to understand God and his faithfulness is to see that as he even challenges us in Malachi to test and see his faithfulness uh, through giving and, and being generous. And there are many ways we can do that, either in the offering boxes, in the back of the room, uh, through the online giving, and of course through sending through our P.O. box, ways we can experience God uh, through generosity, our generosity to him, his, his shovel is bigger than ours. <laughs> and, and he can pour and does pour out so many more things on us uh, and is faithful to do so. Uh, also, I want to remind you, as I did earlier, Circles USA, if you've been, you know, convicted, you know what, there's people out there, I want to be able to come around and help. It, it's not, you know, there are many ways in which you can participate in Circles, even if you're just curious. I mean, maybe you don't know for sure what you want to do, you just want to know more. Click on that connect card. Say, I'm interested in circles. Come to the orientation on the 14th of June here at the church and uh, be a part of that. It's a great way to get to know. And if you need more information, just see me afterward or see uh, one of us. Uh, Wayne uh, also can help with that. And so just let us know, and we would be glad to, uh, to talk with you about that. Also, uh, wings, ladies, if you ordered a T-shirt uh, here back in the day, one of the Faith Over Fear T-shirts, uh, those are available in the foyer today. So please pick up your shirt today. Rebecca Johnson's out there at the table, and she would love to, to give you that shirt. Uh, they're really, really nice T-shirts. We want to make sure you get that. Again, as, been, as has been said, the celebration picnic uh, is after our service here, immediately up on the, at the Hillside Pavilion. We still call it the Hillside Pavilion. I mean, <laughs> it's the Hillside. Uh, but up at the, the picnic shelter house we have up on the hill, uh, we've got everything set up there. Even if you didn't bring a chair, if you came to church today and you're like, I didn't know this was going on. We have chairs. We have tables. You know, we, some of you brought your chairs. That's great, too. But come on up. It's Red State Barbecue, folks. Uh, man, it's, I mean, it's awesome. Uh, just, that should, that's enough right there. Let's just do it. Uh, so after the worship service is done, uh, meet us up there, and we'll get things going probably closer to uh, around 11, 15, 1130, uh, and we'll try to get things uh, getting served up there. And because there's really not anything going on that necessitates it this week, you don't have to pick up any chairs this Yay. week. Yay. <laughs> you can leave them right where you are. Although I would help, please remind yourself to pick up that communion cup and throw it out on your way out since we're not picking up chairs today. Last thing, big congratulations to Clay and Amber Parker on the birth of their child, Serenity, here Thursday. <laughs> We know they are at home. They're po possibly, who knows, they're probably sleeping. They're probably not even <laughs> watching right now. But if they are at home, we love you guys. Praise the Lord for what God has done. And I know we've got other families uh, kind of in, waiting in the wings, expecting uh, uh, babies to be born probably in the next few months here. And so we pray for them. But we celebrate with Clay and Amber uh, for a healthy birth and uh, just continue to lift them up. Uh, as they are uh, adjusting to, to new life as a expanded family now today. Uh, we celebrate with them. With that, Wayne, would you close us with a word of prayer? And then we'll be dismissed. Father, we are so incredibly grateful to be called children of God. And Father, maybe as we walk, um, as we just heard, maybe we walk as that we can become and know God more and be like him and as we study Jesus who was God in the flesh we become more acquainted with who he is and father it just enriches our lives so we thank you for that we thank you that his love lifted us out of the sin that we were in so that we can be with him and have eternal life forever we love you and we praise you in all things it's in Jesus name we pray Amen.